Chef Buff Army. Today I'm going to give you my definitive video on how to build muscle. And I argue that this is the most comprehensive video you'll find on YouTube. Why? Because this video and these laws right here are a direct adaptation of Brad Schoenfeld's work, the mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy, and their application to resistance training. That's the definitive guide that's come out over the last decade researching every single study that's been done with regards towards building muscle and then giving a great comprehensive overview with his findings. If you know me, my training bible is Mel Siff's super training and Brad Schoenfeld was one of the students of Mel Siff. This right here, you can't fuck with this shit, these laws. This is science, people. So I'm going to present to you today purely how to build muscle and the different laws governing that. One, in order to build muscle, it's about contractile and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. What this means, you can think about it simply as contractile is more intensity, a powerlifting style, lower repetitions, higher intensity, whereas sarcoplasmic is increasing the mechanical tension, the total amount of uh, weight and volume that you lift, sticking to a higher rep range between 6 to 12 or 15 repetitions. So think bodybuilding, uh, sort of powerlifting. The key point is that they're interdependent. If you increase your sarcoplasmic hypertrophy by doing 6 to 15 repetitions on you know, the bench press and increase the size of your chest and your muscles over time, bigger muscles have a better advantage towards building strength. Both are related. So in truth, you should target both. If you want pure muscle, a slightly greater emphasis on sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Two, minimum threshold to build muscle. This one's fairly obvious, but in order to build muscle, you have to incur a certain metabolic effect, metabolic damage, muscular damage, or mechanical tension. But what this means is that in every single workout, you have to induce a training response, which is why you know progressive overload is very important. More reps, uh, more time under tension, more total weight lifted. You have to have that minimum threshold for your body. Depends on you. There's no golden law. Do you know 20 sets to grow muscle? It depends on you, but you have to do that minimum threshold. So seek getting better. Three people ask me how long should I rest? And once again, a slightly gray area, but approximately if you want to purely focus on building muscle, resting between about one to two minutes seems to be best. Four. Emphasize the centric portion, the lowering of the weight portion. This is once again if you purely want to build muscle. If you do this too often, you could you know, incur overtraining. Uh, if you also want to build strength, it might not be the best idea to do frequently. However, we're talking about you know mechanical tension and trying to induce metabolic fatigue. So the eccentric portion is the one that induces the most amount of mechanical tension, the most amount of stress on your body, which is good. Stress is important to perturb the body to change. Five, periodization. You knew it was going to come up. Periodization, essentially what it means is planning out your workouts in advance so that you always train for your body's capacity and ability on that day. And Mel Siff was a very big fan of something called auto-regulation, which basically means listening to your body. If you feel great in a workout, do a lot of sets. If you feel like shit, don't do a lot of sets. It's very, very intuitive, this rule. So it doesn't matter if you, you, you know, use undulating periodization or at the very least you listen to your body and use auto-regulation. Six, fairly obvious rule, but compound movements will equal more muscle mass. That doesn't mean you should only do compound movements. It means they should be the cornerstone of your training program. So, you know, squats, deadlifts, bench press, bench over rows, pull-ups. Can you build muscle without those? Absolutely. But will it make it easier? Yes. Why? Because it incurs more stress once again on your body. You're working and utilizing more total muscle. So that should be the cornerstone. And that's why I get back to uh, other important point. Number seven, use isolation training. I put isolation in brackets because remember, you can't truly isolate one muscle. If you do a bicep curl, there's an inner and outer head of the bicep brachialis, uh, your forearms, there's a lot of muscles being worked. But the reason to do isolation training or movements that better emphasize a particular muscle group is that if you only do compound movements, you'll quickly discover you have certain body parts that will grow very fast and certain body parts that will like. By doing isolation movements or by doing exercises that help emphasize or accentuate weak areas, you'll bring them up and you'll develop a more balanced physique. Eight, the question that everybody asks, should you train to failure? Well, the science says you could train to failure infrequently. Why? Because failure, once again, is very stressful on the body, on your central nervous system. You do it too often, you can get a state of overtraining. You can induce a state of overtraining. So failure in a holistic program where you're training three, four, or five times a week, the more times you train, the less times you should train to failure. And it's a tool that you can use and not abuse. So 
I tend to recommend it for once again those isolation movements, maybe perhaps on the last set, only doing it a couple times throughout the week. So you could use failure training, but infrequently. Every set shouldn't be trained to failure. And this is why these laws are important, because this applies to the natural training. That's why you'll see a lot of you know bodybuilders that use steroids and so forth, they train always to failure. That doesn't apply to you. You're not using steroids. The rules are completely different. The next question then is, how much weight should I lift? And this is always expressed as a percentage of your one rep max. If you don't know your one rep max, you don't have to test it out. There are ways of calculating it, you know, based off of your 85% max. But essentially, if you know your one rep max, the loads, the bulk of your loads should be between 65 to 85% of your one rep max. And for most individuals, they're usually good in hitting that target range. 10. How often should you train a muscle group? Well, definitely at least one time a week, but you can also train it twice a week. It depends on you and your split and your setup. But training a muscle group twice in a week is completely fine. Just make sure that you rest approximately 48 hours in between sessions that target the same muscle group. And lastly, it's not a law, but just a great general rule. Everybody wants to know what's the best split. I want to see what this guy does and copy him. The truth, the science says, uh, honestly, there is no best split. You know, uh, upper lower split, push pull legs, doing, you know, a body part split. It depends on the individual. And ooh, that's where individualized training comes into play. Because it depends on your genetics, your current physique level, and your work capacity. There's a lot of different variables. You gotta find what works right for you. I said I was bringing the thunder today, and so I did. These are the irrefutable laws towards building muscle, corroborated with a lot of evidence and science. You can't fuck with that. Thank you for watching my video. Make sure to like, share with friends, and subscribe. Buff Army, I will be seeing you in the next video. Peace. Today, we're talking about twice a day training. How to incorporate...